Well, I'll start with saying g'day, because that's how we greet people in Australia, and we say g'day. And um, I pretty much want to tell a story about where I live, where I live. I come from a country that's quite large, and in that country there's so many opportunities, and I've had lots of opportunities to do lots and lots of things. I've had the opportunity in sport, I've had opportunities um, in teaching, I've had opportunities to look at assessment, look at leadership and work with different people around the world and around the globe and, I'm, and I feel grateful for that. So I've had a lot, lot, a lot of opportunities. But I'm not here to talk about any of that really <laughs> today. I'm here to talk about something else and I want to talk about the epitome of conditions for thinking and creativity. But before I get into that, um, I just want to talk to about what that word epitome means. And it means conditions that possess the highest degree of features. So we're talking about the best conditions in which children actually learn in. We're talking about the ultimate conditions in which children learn. So I just needed to make that clear before we start because now I'm going to divert, because I want to show you where I live. I want to show you where I live. Now, this is me and I live in Australia with my two beautiful children, and I only have two. That fur there doesn't belong to any other child. <laughs> it belongs to me. And that's not the only place I live. Now, I'm, I'm letting out a bit of a secret tonight, and it's probably not the most... I suppose, appropriate time to let out a secret when you know you're being filmed in front of lots and lots of people. But not only do I live in this state here of, of Australia, I also live in this place here. <laughs> this place is the pit. Now, before I get into a couple of stories about the pit, I want to let you know that this thing has been fantastic for me and I haven't always lived here. What used to happen in my state of bliss kind of back here <laughs> was that I used to just graze across the top. <laughs> I never truly went down there. I never truly went down there. And then there was two events that kind of happened in my life that made me think and made me start to question. And I'll share you a story about the first event. And this happened when a friend of mine came back from holiday in America. So he's come back from the USA and he was visiting a place called um, Las Vegas. So in Vegas they like to bet and they like to gamble. So there's lots of people around Las Vegas. And some people there were asking, so mate, you're from Australia? I said, yeah. What do you do there? He said, I'm a stickman. I said, what? We don't have stickmen in America. What's a stickman do? And he said, well, a stickman, what a stickman does is they climb the Harbour Bridge with a stick and they hit down the kangaroos and the koalas. They went, really? Do you know what? They actually believed him. I hope nobody here believed me. <laughs> but they actually believed him. When he came back and told me that story, I thought, how many things have I ever taken for granted? How many things have I just thought was the truth without ever really questioning, without digging deeper, without really thinking about these things? And then the second event came and we had two men visit our school. Uh, these men walked in, uh, Bill Martin and John Edwards, and they walked in with a bit of a swagger and they said, you guys can create the school of your dreams. And we're like, ooh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> we get to create the school of our dreams. And they showed us this model, and it was the pit model. And they said that in creating the school of your dreams, things might actually get worse before they get better. And I'm thinking, well, how's that going to happen? Why aren't things just going to get better? We're creating the school of our dreams. But things are actually going to get worse before they get better. 
you're going to go through storms and you're going to go through what they call the pit. The pit. So, no one had ever wanted to drag me down there before so I could be a better person or so I could make progress. But this was one of the first times that I began to understand the pit and it became a bit of a metaphor for my life and I've lived there ever since. I'm in so many pits right now, little ones, but I know that when I'm out of them, I'm going to be so much better for it. So, I need to tell you a story now about the first pit I was in after Bill and John left us. We had a little bit of shared vision work and they were talking about some current research and they talked about John Hattie and feedback. So what we decided to do as our leadership team in our school organisation was, hey, maybe we should get on this feedback thing. We looked at different ways to do feedback. So we tried. So here's me. I played rugby league, right? And a bit of a tough sport, apparently. And here's the other leadership members of the leadership team. And they're three women. They're three women. And they're beautiful people to work with. Absolutely lovely. So here we are. We're having these brutally honest conversations. Brutally honest. So what do these women start to do? I start to cry. <laughs> so we're giving feedback. So I'm running over here getting a tissue box and bringing it back. Oh, she's had her feedback now. Next bit of feedback, the next person. Oh, they've had their feedback. Anyway, it gets to my turn. So what do I do? My turn for... I start crying too. <laughs> All this feedback. It, 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 the brutal truth of it. And that's when I got into one of my first pits. From hearing that feedback though, from being down there and feeling that, could you imagine how much I grew? I grew so much. And I was thinking then, well if it's taken me 25, say 26 years, to get down into one of these pits and actually consider things, then I need to get my kids in the pit that I teach. I need to get them down in there constructing knowledge, making things better, making connections, thinking deeply about things. And I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to do that. So what happened then is that I was lucky enough to meet um, James Nottingham. And James showed me how to get pretty much children down there into the pit. And showed me a model of this pit and he could relate it to learning to learning and I was a bit I suppose enthused about philosophy for children so James was able to show me that if you question children and create cognitive conflict in children then you can drag them down and their understanding when they consider reflect create their understandings will be much, much higher than what they began. So I thought about this. I introduced the pit to my children. And the understandings he was right about. So here I am creating cognitive conflict. And you can do that by simply questioning students. So that one might say, what's a friend? And the children will say, someone who's nice to you. Well... I went to the doctors the other day. He was very nice to me. Gave me a nice needle right here. Does that mean he's nice? Does it mean he's my friend? Hmm. So typically children say, well, friends are somebody who plays with you. So then if I play with you, does that mean I'm your friend? They had to consider, once you ask those questions to drag them down into the pit, the consideration and the thoughtfulness of children is absolutely amazing. Now, I remember one philosophy lesson. This is one of the first ones that I taught, and it was about stealing. Now, I opened up with a simple question. Is it okay to steal? And the kids, a typical response, no, 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 no. You can't steal. What about Robin Hood? He used to steal. Give to the poor. Is that all right? 
Well, that could be. That could be all right. Who's got an example, I said, of in this classroom? Who can think of an example when it might be okay to steal? So a little fella puts his hand up. He's eight years old. And he says, well, I think it might be okay to steal sometimes um, when, you know, you've asked mum and dad for an eraser. You've asked them for one week and they haven't got you one. You've asked them for two weeks and they still haven't got you one. And he reaches in his pocket and goes, Mr. Burns, here's your eraser back. <laughs> <laughs> it was gold. Because that moment, the children were thinking, is that okay? Is it not okay? Their opinion by dragging them down in this pit caused them to consider. It caused them to reflect. And they looked at metacognition and they made associations with different things. And it's such a powerful tool. The work that the children produced, the connections they made, the language they used, was absolutely phenomenal. And the change in my teaching was only minute. I only had to learn how to question, to question. Because once you question these children, the things that they produced and the answers they came up with made me learn. And here I was, not being a leader, or not so much being telling them what to learn, but showing them how to learn. I was a co-learner. Now, what I want to do now is, is, I suppose, talk to you about how then I use this to create cognitive conflict, but how we can use this not only in thinking, but to create creativity in schools. Because I want to probably talk about a, a TED talk that I saw involving Ken Robertson and how schools can create, kill creativity. And it got me looking at a few things and it got me questioning and I asked myself, what are the best conditions for creativity? So I began to look around and study CEOs of big companies and corporations and I looked at many different things and educational research. And I also looked at current reality. Now, if we look at, at our current reality, I'm not sure about over here, but I know in many pockets of the world, current reality is that in schools, particularly, we focus on results. People are focusing more and more on results. Results are getting published in newspapers. They're getting put on the websites. You know, that's changing the way we teach because we want results. So it changes our pedagogy. And what that's doing is maybe taking away from the creativity of our children at the detriment. So if we focus on results, what we should be absolutely focusing on is their progress, is children's progress. So it's important as us, for us as educators that we don't focus totally on results. Yeah, they're important. They are. But so is creativity and so is that in children. And it's us that can make the difference. It's truly us that can make the difference. Now, the thing is, expertise must adapt with time. They must adapt with time. I don't want to go to a doctor who's using medicines that were invented 10 years ago now that aren't up to date, that have gone out of date, you know? I want to go back to the 1920s and have to take some of the medicines that they had to taste. So as teachers, I suppose it's our job, and it is our job, that our expertise adapt with time. And they change. We must adapt. We need to adapt to learn how to use iPads now, because they're coming in. So as teachers, we adapt. We look at different things and how we can relate them to the context in which we are in now. And it's important that our teaching methods change. And it's important that we take things and relate them to our context. And this pit model for me, and relating it to the context of my life, knowing that it's going to get better, and taking this pit model and relating it to student learning, I've seen so much change in students. 
in students. Um, the thing about creativity and getting students in the pit is that we need to allow opportunities for this to happen more than once. You just can't get them in the pit and leave them there. Well, I suppose you could, but it's not really fair. We have to give them strategies to work out and, and teaching tools. And again, that's the questions we ask. And again, it's the, the dialogue that we allow to happen between students in each classroom. So it requires commitment. Creativity requires commitment. It requires failure. And it requires learning. And the only reason we, we fail is if we don't give our students the opportunities to make mistakes themselves. Right? We can't give students the answers all the time. We've got to let them create their own answers. So we have to create this cognitive conflict to get them down there. So the things about innovating and creating is it's about making, making existing things better. So that's what we try and do. That's what innovators try and do, make existing things better. And simple as asking a child, like, how could you make this classroom better? And listening to them. And their creative responses are very, very surprising. Very, very surprising. I suppose as teachers, we need to spark that passion and be curators of this creativity and to help grow it in our students, to help grow it. And there needs to be that balance. There needs to be that balance of, yes, let's look at our results, but also, hey, let's give our children opportunities to create, to be creators. Let's give them these conditions where we're going to challenge them, where we're going to make them think and require them to think. So let's do that. Let's make that commitment. Because in the end, to be honest, we don't teach because of the paycheck we take home. <laughs> we don't do that. It's to make a difference in these children's lives and to make a positive difference. So what we need to do is we need to not teach children what to learn, but we need to teach children how to learn because they're the skills they're going to take away with them. The knowledge that we teach them they might remember this much. They might remember this much. But if we teach them how, we give them opportunities to create connections in the pit for them to know how, they can apply that to different situations in their life. And that's so much more powerful, so much more powerful than teaching them facts about things. Teaching them about pronouns and nouns. Gee, that's interesting. <laughs> And even one of our most famous scientists was able to recognise something very important. Something very important. And Albert Einstein was able to recognise that imagination is more important than knowledge. So if we can teach our children to dream and dare to dream and facilitate their dreams, facilitate their creativity, create these conditions where they can make connections deep connections and that's what I think is doing our job as educators so I just want to finish up on one last quote and it says people who think they are crazy enough to change the world are the ones that do you know are the ones that actually do so food for thought food for thought I thank you for giving me the time to speak to you tonight thank you Jesus.